Hey, everybody. Creative people, super excited to be here. Uh, I'm just going to set this up really quickly. Have you guys all been to Creative Mornings before? Awesome. Well, this is my first time, so uh, really excited to be here, and I, I can't wait to come again. Um, really excited to be here at SciArc, too. I love this place. Thank you, John. And um, the work that people do here is just incredible. Um, I really love experimentation. I love uh, the creation of new things, the desire to create new things and try something out. Um, but I just wanted to kind of think just in general for a second. Uh, am I speaking too loudly, by the way? OK, perfect. Um, think for a second about sort of where we stand in the, in the grand scheme of things, right? Um, our daily lives are, you know, pretty easy to, you know, well, hard to keep track of that, but where are we? Okay, so we're in a time where um, there's thought scientifically to be more planets than there are stars, which is pretty incredible. I mean, you think of the world of like Star Trek and Star Wars and all the science fiction that seems so fiction. Um, that world is um, perhaps coming up. We are in a world where uh, there's, uh, you know, uh, like sector is of space exploration is not only government anymore. Uh, we see Elon Musk launching rockets, the Jeff Bezos getting into the same thing. Um, pretty soon, it's safe to say that we could be an interplanetary species. Um, we're in a world that um, is creating artificial intelligence and robotics. Um, we are able to augment our senses to see and to feel things that were impossible not long ago. And um, it's an incredible world. And we are incrementally stepping forward, step by step by step, in everything we do into a completely different time. And I know that's very, very general, but um, it sort of feels right now like there's an energy like we're stepping into the world of science fiction. And it's super exciting. Um, it makes me think, though, you know, about sort of where, I am, where I'm at in my life and, um, and the people that have influenced me a lot. And um, one of those people uh, absolutely is my father. I've been thinking about him a lot. And, you know, it's so funny, like, in just preparing for this talk, I was like, oh, well, you know, maybe I'll, I'll remember something that, that he said that, you know, really kind of drove me in my life. And it's kind of funny because the one thing that really came up was this. <laughs> He's like... Believe nothing that you hear and only half of what you read. And um, I looked it up and I was really surprised that it was by, you know, Edgar Allan Poe. Um, but it, it's, you know, the fact that that was the first thing that came up to me was kind of cool in a way because, you know, I, I like the fact that um, we don't have to go around just believing stuff. We don't have to go around just thinking that what people tell us is true. Um, but if you do go around trying to figure out what is true and trying to explore and trying new things, then it could lead to a world um, that uh, is in incredibly and deeply fascinating and interesting. And um, that's what brought me to this other quote that I love so much, um, that the universe is filled with incredible, magical, and unbelievable things that we just haven't discovered yet, right? That, that these things are out there, they're right around us, they're out in the universe, and they're there. But we're not smart enough yet. We don't have the technology yet. Our wits are not sharp enough yet. And so um, it really makes me think, wow, okay, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna do it? And um, we're having a creative morning, right? You're creative people. And it seems like it's creativity that's gonna allow this to happen. And um, of course, curiosity too. And so when I think of magical things, um, what does that mean? Magical is kind of a funny word. Incredible things, things that surprise you, things that make you feel awe, make you feel wonder. This is one of them. This is Halley's Comet, uh, photographed um, in, uh, by the European Space Agency. But when I think of a comet, I didn't uh, think of this, right? That I always think of that streak in the sky. But when you get really close, you'll see that that streak in the sky has like this central mass to it. It's this just rocky, icy mountain that uh, when it comes close to the sun, gives off uh, a lot of water vapor, and that water vapor just shoots, you know, catches the light and creates this beautiful tail. 
And um, we wanted to capture the magic of this. And there was a time uh, when the European Space Agency in 2014 was going to land on a comet for the first time. And still to this day, people are, are really interested in comets because they're mysterious. Um, and this mission ended up giving a lot of information about that. But questions that were being asked scientifically were, um, did the water on Earth come from comets? You know, if these things are made out of ice, maybe there was a beginning uh, when the Earth was being shaped, when just comets were flying down and landing on Earth, right? Um, a very dangerous time, obviously. It probably wouldn't be a good thing to happen right now. But, um, but did water come from Earth? And what are comets actually made of, you know? And so we were asked, uh, because JPL had a, a role in this mission of creating a few instruments, how do we get people to think about comets? And we went through this whole, you know, long, you know, research basically, learning curve of what are comets made out of, very tons of details, and really kind of just went back to the fact that comets are absolutely beautiful things, and they create the most mysterious and beautiful tales. And so we wanted to give that experience to people. And so this is what we created. Um, it's a comet that is uh, human scale. And we just wanted to allow people to experience the wonder of what it's like to see something for the first time. Uh, we worked with architect Jason Klamoski from Brooklyn um, to create this beautiful piece. And uh, just wanted to allow people to ask questions. One of the things that I think is, is really fun for us is that we discovered that sometimes if you give too much information, people lose their interest. And so we thought, well, can we just give just enough information for people to feel a sense of wonder, for people to start asking questions, for kids to experience a sense of play? And this is when we saw this, we were just completely blown away. Um, our, we, our, my team, or our team, uh, my really good friend Dan and I looked at this girl hugging herself, and uh, we just thought, wow, this is it. This is what we wanted to do. Hopefully they can remember it. Of course, when you know, people are getting married and showing up and taking pictures in front of it, it was also kind of cool. Um, but it was interesting because rather than try to explain what a comet is, we wanted to get people to ask what a comet was. And it was a totally different approach that really worked well for us. I mean, there's a million places that you can go where people can tell you things or you can find out things. But I feel like what's being lost in this world is the curiosity to find out and the personal intention to try to figure things out on your own. And so we thought, well, maybe that's something that we could focus on, you know? On the second day of um, my job at JPL, a long, long time ago, it was kind of funny. I mentioned my buddy Dan Goods. He was the artist in residence there, a good friend of mine. We've always uh, loved working well together, and, and he invited me to come to JPL, and I eventually started working with him there. And on my second day, he called me up and he said, hey, David, do you want to go uh, to Goldstone on the NASA plane? And <laughs> I didn't know what Goldstone was. I didn't know NASA had a plane. But of course, my answer was, yeah, <laughs> definitely do. Um, and it turns out that uh, NASA at that time had a little plane. And they could fly out to this place here called Goldstone. And what Goldstone is, um, even though it sounds like a James Bond movie or something, it is uh, one of the sites around the world that JPL and NASA own. Uh, that it's called the Deep Space Network, and these are radio antenna that are pointing into the sky that are continuously um, sending signals back and forth from spacecraft around the solar system, right? And what, you know, so this is one, there's one here in California, there's one in Australia, and there's one in California, Australia, and in Madrid, right? So, they are, if you think about that, it's almost equally spaced around the globe so that um, NASA can transition the signals, you know, as the world spins. Uh, this one's in California. You can see it's in the middle of the desert. And you go there and, you know, with the amount of activity that you know is happening, you, you, know, you kind of get there and you say, well, this is boring. <laughs> right? Because there's no, like, our senses are so um, limited and yet at the same time, uh, you know, there's so much information out there. And so um, technology gives us a sense of that. We've mastered technology to the extent that we can do this kind of thing. But when you go there, it, there's still, a, 
it's there's still a sense that, wow, I'm missing something. I'm not getting it, you know? It's beyond my senses. And that's something that um, has really uh, become like a, a founding um, principle for us, is, or uh, I guess what, more of like a creative boost for us, is that can we give people those experiences that are beyond their senses, um, but in a way allow them to use their senses, to use their human, naturally given human qualities to experience something that is invisible, something that is unsensible. Um, with our with our human experience, and so you know, you look at things like this, and you know, huge amounts of information are going by, and so we thought, oh man, what if we what if we could create this this speaker system on steroids that would just allow people to be able to hear what's actually going on? Imagine if you could hear uh, the Voyager spacecraft if it was as it was going out of our solar system. Imagine if you could hear um, a spacecraft as, as it was passing over your head, like a satellite or a CubeSat. And so um, we had an opportunity to do something about that uh, with a project that we did for the World Science Festival um, that's actually now here in, at the Huntington Library. Uh, you can go see it. So but we, the idea was that we were going to uh, build this, this dome, right? And inside the dome, we'd have um, speakers. And we wanted to be able to allow people to listen to those unsensible, undetectable things with our senses, which just with the sense of hearing, like you would hear a bird fly over your head. And so what we did is we took, uh, we looked at all of the NASA Earth science satellites, right? And remember in space, there's, there's no, you can't hear anything, right? There's still, there's waves, but you can't, you can't translate that to sound if you're there. So we thought, well, what if we were to give each of those spacecraft their own voice, right? Their own unique sound. And we worked with this amazing artist, uh, Shane Mirbeck, um, who's a sound um, engineer and a composer and, um, so he gave each one of these things, these very, very interesting sounds. And the idea was that we would allow them to say hello to us as they would pass overhead, just so we would, they would, people would get a sense that, uh, that they're there, that they're present, um, almost like you hear birds flying or, you know, if you close your eyes, you get a sense of the types of things that are around you. And that's what we wanted to do. And so um, this is what we created. This is actually at the Huntington now. You can go see it. It was originally there for four months, and now it's... spacecraft on its orbit to move the sound across the inside of the dome. So it sounds like you're hearing the spacecraft as it crosses above you in the sky. And what we really wanted to do is get people to do this, is just walk inside, listen, and close their eyes and just get a sense of the presence of all of the spacecraft that are above them at that given time. And if you hear something, you point your finger. Um, we spent a lot of time trying to make sure this was true. When you hear it, you point your finger, and that's the exact location of that NASA satellite as it passes overhead. And um, I invite you to go check it out. It should be there till the end of the summer. Um, and we're actually looking for another place to put it afterward. But um, this was done in a, a collaboration uh, with my buddy Dan Goods at JPL, also with Shane Mirvek, who uh, I mentioned earlier. Uh, but also with architect Jason Klamoski of Studio KCA in Brooklyn. And um, that was a, our core team, and it was just awesome to work with uh, that collaboration. Um, but I wanted to tell you a little bit of a story of, of how some things come to light in, in very weird ways. Um, this is a, a hallway at JPL. <clears throat> it's, a, it's kind of a funny place because um, sometimes projects start in, in small ways. Uh, there was uh, this hallway, if you, if you walk down the hallway, in fact, you can see the edge of the door right there on the left-hand side of the screen. That door is to the um, NASA Exoplanet Exploration Office. And um, it sounds awesome, it is awesome. That's the place where um, scientists are gathering to develop new plans to discover new exoplanets. And uh, it, it is a place where uh, the current exoplanet missions are run. There was a time when Sarah Seeger, who's a famous exoplanet scientist, was going to come visit JPL. And so the exoplanet office asked us to 
create something that would celebrate the diversity of exoplanets. And just to give you a sense of what that actually means, um, first of all, exoplanets are planets around other stars. Our star is the sun. And when you look up in the sky, just about every star that you see um, probably has planets around it, um, based on what we've seen so far. Thousands and thousands of exoplanets have been discovered. The goal is to discover planets like Earth. Um, hopefully that will happen someday. We have discovered Earth-like planets, but if it, it's hard to know if they're, if they're exactly like Earth. But, um, let me take. To give you a sense of the diversity and craziness of it all, um, there are planets that, that rain molten glass, which is insane. I don't even really know how that works. <laughs> there are planets that are, are drifting alone in space that are, have no connection to a parent star that are just these, these free-floating, drifting planets. How that happened, we have no idea. There's a lot of scientific ideas about that. There are planets that are thought to be made of consistencies like styrofoam. There are gas planets that are you know, enormous, enormous in scale, so much bigger than Jupiter. And um, there are Earth-like planets. Uh, one of them is, uh, the closest one is about four light years away. It's called Proxima b. And uh, someday that could be the closest one that, um, that we can reach out to. And it, it's thought to be a rocky planet. And so we might be able to go there someday. Um, but when you start thinking about all of these crazy characteristics, it, we were wondering, you know, there's a million ways to show that diversity. Um, but one of the funny things that happened is that this building uh, was the the uh, first, actually the first lead building at uh, JPL, a uh, beautiful building. I wish I knew the architect who built it, um, so, but I, I don't know who did it, so I, I can't mention them, but it's a beautiful building. But the architect did one thing that um, kind of had us all puzzled the whole time, is uh, he, uh, he or she, or all of them, uh, made room for information that could be held out in front of each of the big meeting rooms. And strangely, I guess JP, nobody at JPL ever took advantage of that. And it was kind of a, so these, they were just like these empty poster frames there continuously. And I don't know what it was, but they were these like pristine, you know, acrylic sheets that were just begging for somebody to put something cool inside there. And so when we were in the hallway, just sort of dreaming about what could this be? What could we do to get people to think about the diversity of exoplanets? Um, we of course started thinking about what it would be like to go there. And, um, and the idea of uh, perhaps making posters came up. Um, but when we looked at some of these exoplanet, exoplanets, we'd get, I, I'd get sort of uh, just deeply enthralled about these types of visualizations of exoplanets, right? Um, this is not an image of an exoplanet. This is not uh, like the view through somebody's telescope. Um, normally, exoplanets are discovered in, in a different way. Their presence is... Um, in many cases discovered when you see, you stare at a star and you see a little um, light dip every now and then, right? Because the scientists are sort of looking at the full amount of light that's coming from one area and they look for just these little dips in light, you know, it goes down and it goes down. And if it happens on a repeated, um, in a repeated way, they go, oh wow, maybe it's something going in circles that's blocking that light, right? It's going in circles around this star and blocking the light. And so that's the type of way that people know that they're there. There's a, um, a lot of other, I guess, scientific means that are beyond my, uh, beyond my level. Um, but uh, people are starting to figure out what types of uh, atmospheres are on exoplanets. Um, but we haven't really yet gotten a clear image like this. So we don't know what some planet, most planets look like, exoplanets. And so that notion kind of captured our imagination and, and we um, would it sort of invented this little game within our studio to try to test to see if we could uh, test each other to see if, uh, if what we were showing um, was an example of the characteristics of an exoplanet or was an example of an exoplanet or was an exoplanet. You guys wanna play this game? Yeah. All right, okay. So here we go. Is that an exoplanet? Yeah? Sorry guys, it's a hamburger bun. <laughs> you know, is that an exoplanet? Oh, yeah, it's obvious avocado. <laughs> so, <laughs> it was really fun. We, we were just obviously joking around. 
but um, it really kind of pointed out to us that, you know, you go back to images like this and it, it feels very realistic, right? But in fact, we have no idea, we don't really have a very good clue of what they're like. We have a pretty good idea of what some of the characteristics may be given the type of um, science that's been done on them and just in their context. And so um, when we look back at those empty poster frames, um, we thought, oh, okay, great. Well, let's do posters. And maybe it's about just one thing about that place, right? And of course, what called out to us was um, travel posters from the 30s. It just sort of felt right. And uh, we wanted to go there. We wanted to travel there. We wanted to be a part of it. And we wanted to, like, honestly, seriously look into the future and say, you know what? I think this might happen. I mean, we are at a point in our life that people are discovering them. And you know how that goes. Once you know it's there, it's only a matter of time, I think, before somebody will go. You think about what happened to Mars. I mean, it's only, you know, with 100 years ago that um, people thought that, you know, the well, War of the Worlds, we were going to get attacked by these Martians. And now all of a sudden, who knows, we probably are the Martians, right? We're going to go there and, uh, and then look at ourselves and be like, oh, they, you know, here we are. Um, but looking back at the characteristics of the exoplanets, um, this is sort of this, our, our initial take on what to do um, for these posters is there are planets that, uh, where there's two stars, and these, these sort of more represent the questions that we are asking ourselves. Is, you know, if there's planets with two stars, um, would you have two shadows? You know, if there are planets that um, are around a red star, would the planets, I mean, would the plants be red? Or could plants evolve in a different way to photosynthesize um, to reflect a different kind of light? And I, both of those things could be true in different places. Or are there planets with like more gravity, right? That actually, when you, you know, if you were to jump off, like what would be fun? And so we kind of put on our, our marketing hat as like tourists, uh, you know, tourist salesmen and thought, you know, what, what could we do just in a fun way to get people to think about that and sort of within a tongue in cheek kind of style, uh, get them to want to go to these places. And so here we have Kepler 16b, the planet that has, uh, you know, two stars, two suns, which, you know, and this is a very, we took a very serious approach to this, where your shadow always has company. <laughs> or, you know, Kepler 186F, where the grass is always redder on the other side. Um, or, you know, even on a place where there's extreme gravity, like what would be fun to do in that place? And that, that led to a whole series um, of posters that, that you can download if you go to the JPL website. Um, but it was just a tremendous amount of fun. And what was kind of cool about it too, and actually a little bit weird is, you know, here we are, now you guys know that we designed this, literally our, our, the request was to decorate a hallway, right? And, and somehow, you know, people would start taking pictures of this and they got out and started going crazy and everybody started sharing it. And then JPL thought, okay, well, yeah, well maybe we'll print these and pass them out at uh, a conference or whatnot. And uh, people went nuts over them. And it was a total compliment to us, but, I think the reality, the power of what is going on here is that I think for the first time you could do something like this and it wasn't science fiction anymore. You know, it wasn't something that was a dream anymore. It was like, we're just one step closer to doing that. You know, we know those places are real and we know those characteristics are real. And even though this is a, a flight of imagination of trying to get to those places and imagining what it would be like to be there, um, those places are real, you know? And we can do it. I think we can do it someday, right? And all of the steps that we take with our, in our creative lives to push things forward, trying new things, that's the type of thing that will get us there. Um, I read on the SciArc website this morning that, that um, you know, that sort of building uh, architects of the future, right? And I love that phrase. I love the idea of being an architect of the future because that hope that's built into a future that you desire, why can't we try to create that? And, and that's what we wanted to um, provide with these, is like, hey, let's go there. I mean, these are the carrot for us, right? We wanna get to that place. And you know, uh, that push in technology and in science um, is one of the areas that will help push us in that direction. What was also kind of funny is that we found out that when you do things that are um, paid for by the public, it's used by the public and free for the public, and so the public uses them. And we found these websites where it was really awesome that people were taking, we could buy almost anything that we wanted with the posters on them. And by the way, I, I do, wanna, do, do wanna call out um, 
my, my good friend, um, Joe B. Harris, who was the principal illustrator on all of these posters, um, did an amazing job. And um, so these are all his illustrations. And he was cracking up, you know, because we were deciding which, uh, which one would he, he would get. And it was kind of funny because uh, the only thing that, like, really, uh, I think this one's for Joby. The only thing that, um, not, not that he needs that, but the only thing that, uh, that really kind of turned us off a little bit, weren't, couldn't they be more expensive? I mean, <laughs> I know a $30 flask is kind of a lot to pay, but, you know, we wanted them to be like 60 bucks or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So, um, yeah, it was just, it was it's just so funny. And um, it kind of reminded us that I heard on the radio the other day that uh, it was this discussion by a psychologist on, on, I forgot what radio program, but they were talking about you know, our general disposition in life as, as humans, right, is that, is that we're very lucky in some ways, because on the spectrum between despair and, and hope, we're, if you, you know, think of that as like 100%, we're like 51% on the side of hope, you know? And, and it's like, like that 1% is what gets us through life. It gets us out of bed in the morning. It like helps us plan the day. It helps us like, you know, think about what we wanna do for vacation because hope is sort of built into our species, you know? And I love, I love that. I love that hope is built into our species. And so when, why can't we use that more? And, and this was our first jump into that world of, of using the sort of the call of the future and the hope of the future, um, really to kind of draw people in that direction. And I know that's a new, not a new idea, but, um, and I think when we're talking about curiosity, um, it, be, it was a new idea for us and a new idea for me and a new idea that gave us like a huge amount of creative fuel to, to think about approaches to arts and design and to, you know, talking about science. And um, it made me think of, you know, so what have I learned? You know, like what is all of this, how has all of this changed me? And um, each project we do is, is a learning curve for me. I'm not a scientist, I'm not an engineer, I'm a designer um, by training. I'm a, uh, I actually studied advertising at Art Center, um, so I love ideas. Um, I studied anthropology at UCLA. I love people, I love culture, and I don't love technology. <laughs> actually, I do love technology. Oh, see, that worked. I love technology. <laughs> but what have I learned? And, and, um, and through this whole thing, it's like, uh, the, you know, the things you do kind of just in, get into you. They infect you. And so um, is I've learned that, that there's a lot of things to be worried about these days. But if you focus on trying to create new things, your curiosity can outgrow your fear. And... I feel like that's happened to me, and I don't know when it happened, you know? And, and I think that leads to, to the next thing that I've learned, is that we give and we get permission to wonder, is that it's not, it's not something that just happens to us naturally all the time. And I think, like, a, the forces of life these days actually try to change that. They actually try to take away your permission to wonder. They try to... Um, take those things away from you. You should know it already. Sit down. Don't raise your hand. Don't ask those questions. Turn it in on time. Well, I always throw that in there. But, you know, I think when, when I've been thinking about in the beginning about th there are a lot of people who've given, who've given me permission to wonder. And um, I hope that I've given those things to other people too. But to know that it's a privilege and not a, uh, a given um, means that we have to participate in order to have it, right? And so we wanna give people permission to wonder through the work that we do. Um, and that we hope that we get that permission to create that. And I think we're all in a position to be able to give that to each other. Um, and the last thing is, especially in these strange times that we're living in right now, in many different ways. Um, there are a whole lot of reasons to look at what's going on and to say, 
man, oh man, what the heck is going on with people, right? What's wrong with us? And, and I have learned that it's not, it's not, we're not like all horrible. <laughs> that, that, that there are reasons to feel proud to be human, you know? There are reasons. And that um, if we can make art about that, if we can focus on those things, if we can just think about those things for a little part of our day, I, I think it, it will change us, you know? And it, it will affect those other two things that I was talking about before. Um, it'll affect our, our ability to give people permission, and it'll affect our ability to overcome fear uh, with curiosity. And um, I, I just want to leave you today with one thing. This is, uh, I've mentioned my buddy Dan a couple times. Um, we're actually, uh, we work together at JPL. We're also starting um, something called the Museum of Awe, which, which we love the idea that we could be living in this thing called the Museum of Awe. It's uh, all around us. Um, the collection is everywhere. It hasn't yet fully been discovered. And um, it's up to us to try to um, sort of notice those beautiful things around us. What we're looking at here are some things that are normally invisible to us. Um, this is a raining cloud of alcohol gas. Um, you can make these things. This is one that Dan made. Uh, it is um, inside. You can Google a cloud chamber. Um, the reason why we made this um, is that is in order to see these streaks. Do you see these streaks coming through? So what those are, are those are very tiny, small particles that are the end result of a chain reaction of a star exploding. A star explodes, sends out huge amounts of energy. That energy goes through our solar system, goes through our universe for billions of years, hits our atmosphere, collides with atoms that are torn apart, and then rain down upon us. And these things are called muons. And they go through us all day, every day, throughout uh, the entire existence of Earth. They've been here, and we can't see them. We can't feel them. We can't sense them in any other way. Or some tech, obviously, there's other ways with technology. But this is a very rudimentary way. And what's really cool is that you can see it. You can see these things piercing through this little cloud of, of uh, alcohol vapor. Uh, like rubbing alcohol, not vodka, and, and um, it's sort of evidence of this secret world that, that we live in um, that is yet to be discovered. There is, you know, magical things that are out there that are waiting for our wits to grow sharper. And so, I challenge all of you to, to go out there and try to discover these things. And if you look, believe me, they're there. And our hope uh, is with this concept, we want to create uh, some traveling exhibits. Um, it's not a museum. We live in the museum. But exhibits that use art and design and theater and science and food and all that we can use all of our senses to try to experience some of these little things in life um, that make us think a little bit more deeply, make us realize that there is more than what we have today. There is more than what you are going to experience for the rest of this day today. There's more than what's in the news. There's more than what's currently in the scientific sort of realm. There's more out there. And we are just at the very infancy. We're at the very, very beginning of discovery. And um, what we need are more people to be curious. And so I want to leave that um, there. Um, thank you guys very much. Uh, you know, the, I don't normally put so many quotes up, but I found them just like sort of just coming to me in, in so many different directions. Um, but uh, we, we morphed this quote from John Muir. Um, he said, the mountains are calling and I must go. Um, but there's more than the mountains. Um, there's stars, and there's more than stars. There are things that we don't even know about yet, and those things are calling out to you, and I say, let's go. Thank you.